Hello everyone and welcome to the .NET Core podcast, the only podcast which is devoted to .NET Core, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, SignalR and not forgetting the .NET Core community itself. I am your host Jamie Kaprogman taylor and this is episode 2, Getting Started with .NET Core. In this episode I'll talk you through how to get started with .NET Core, the software you'll need to install in order to build things with .NET Core and a little on the different types of applications you can build with it. So let's sit back. Open up a terminal, type in .NET New Podcast, and let the show begin. Returning listeners will know that I've been writing about .NET Core for almost two years as I record this. I'm quite an evangelist, although on a small scale at the moment. I'm not a Microsoft employee, and I just want to say that before we begin. Everything that I say during the course of this podcast episode is my own opinion or interpretation of the subject. In this episode, I'm going to take you through the essentials for getting started with .NET Core. What tools you'll need, what operating systems you'll need, the benefits and pitfalls of using specific applications, all that kind of stuff. As a reminder, I do write about .NET Core over at .NET Core.caprogman.com, and if you take a look at the first few posts that I wrote there, Uh, I'll link them in the show notes so you can check your podcatcher for a link. You'll see all the stuff related to the basics of getting set up. However, I'll point out that these posts were written back in the early days of .NET Core 1.0, so some of the points will be a little bit out of date. Also, as time goes on, the stuff that I talk about in this episode will become out of date. I'll try to keep any links in the show notes up to date, uh, did I mention you should check those, for a short while after this episode goes live and I'll make a point of creating an up-to-date episode as time goes on, as this might be something we need to revisit from time to time. Anyway, let's get started with .NET Core right after this. With this an episode about the .NET framework, I'd be advising you to fire up your Windows PC. But gone are those days, because by its very nature, the .NET Core runtime is completely cross-platform, as is the SDK the compiler, the tool chains, and the IDEs, uh, that's integrated developer environments. I'll take a moment here and explain something a little bit about me. Back in 2004, when I was a freshman at uni, my programming 101 class was taught entirely in c using version 2 of the .NET framework. Our lecturer, Rob Miles, yes, that Rob Miles, the big yellow slash pink c book guy, Rob Miles, uh, check the show notes for a link if you don't know what I'm referring to, taught the course using his laptop, a VGA to overhead projector, notepad, and the .NET Framework CLI. That's the command line interface for anyone who doesn't know. He'd open notepad, type some code live, then drop out to the command prompt to compile and run his applications. Combine that with my background, I'll add a link in the show notes to a blog post I once wrote on the first computer that my brother and I ever had, and you'll understand why I've always been a fan of the CLI. Where possible, I've used the CLI on all my computers. The invention of Docker, which we'll cover in a later episode, Node, and the work of folks like Jess Frizzell have brought about a renaissance of sorts for the CLI. But I digress. As a further side note, if you're into Docker, I would heartily recommend checking out Jess Frizzell's Dockerfile GitHub repo. She has Dockerized pretty much every application you'll ever need to use. Because of my background, I took to .NET Core via the CLI, which is something that I'd recommend every developer tries out. The developer experience with the .NET Core CLI tooling is fantastic. In fact, it's a first-class citizen, and Visual Studio has been, until very recently, a second-class citizen to it. There are reasons for this, which we'll come to soon enough. Anyway, back to the plot. What do you need to get started? Well, first you need a computer... It has to be running either Windows 10, Mac OS, or one of the supported Linuxes. Um, I don't know whether you could tell, but I did bunny quotes when I said Linuxes there. The supported list of Linuxes are things like Ubuntu and Debian, Arch and all of its derivatives, OpenSUSE and Fedora. And that list is obviously subject to change at any point. For the most basic .NET Core code, that's all you need. Seriously. Well, you need a web browser too. Microsoft have built a wonderful page which allows you to try .NET Core in the browser. Um, I'll add links to the show notes. Uh, No, it's not running Blazor, which we'll talk about in a later episode. The way it works is you type your code into the browser, it gets packaged up and sent to a compiler in the cloud, and the output is sent back to you. It's a little bit like .NET Fiddle if you've ever used that service. (laughs) 
But let's say that you want to get started with .NET Core on your desktop or laptop computer without having to rely on the cloud. Well, the first thing you need to do is head over to .net slash core. That's D-O-T dot N-E-T slash C-O-R-E. Check the show notes. Once you get there, you'll see links to the SDK and the instructions for setting it up on your computer. It's not foolproof, but there is some JavaScript embedded in the page which tries to identify what your computer is running and will try to present you with the most relevant instructions to you. Once you've downloaded and installed the SDK, you can check whether it's running by opening a terminal or a command prompt if you're in Windows and typing .net space dash dash version. That's D-O-T-N-E-T space hyphen hyphen V-E-R-S-I-O-N. The first time you run it, the .NET Core runtime and SDK will do some extra setup stuff and it might take a few seconds to complete. Then it'll tell you which version you have installed. I ran that command on my MacBook Air shortly before recording this episode and it cheerily reported that I was running version 2.1.302, which is also known by its more common name of 2.1.2. Once that's done, you'll need a way to write .NET Core code. I mainly write C Sharp these days, and I can write that using anything that I want. As long as it saves your code as plain text, then you're good to choose whatever you want. I really like Visual Studio Code, which is a free editor from Microsoft and is based on Electron. There are plugins for it, which will add support for just about anything you can think of. But your tooling isn't limited to Visual Studio Code, obviously. There's also things like Visual Studio for Windows, which I sometimes call VS. Visual Studio for Mac, which is a rebranded version of Xamarin Studio, Atom, Sublime, VI or VM, Emacs, JetBrains is Rider, Notepad, Notepad++, TextEdit, Partridge in a Pear Tree. Okay, that last one was a little silly, but like I say, as long as the program you use can output plain text files, you can write your code in it. Anyway, let's say that you want to install Visual Studio Code like I have. Well, you can get an installer by heading over to code.visualstudio.com. Once you've installed that, we're ready to take a look at making our first app. You might be worrying about how I'm going to describe a code listing using just audio. Although it's not unheard of, um, I have an audiobook version of Dreaming in Code, and that has sections where the narrator is literally just reading out code listings, I'm going to avoid that as much as possible, mainly because it's boring. Also, because I'm from the UK, and I'll probably use slightly different words for different characters. Most of us over here call parentheses brackets, and some of us call curly braces curly brackets, and obviously there's the dash and hyphen issue. Anyway, you've nothing to worry about in that respect. Now that you have the .NET Core SDK and a text editor installed, we're going to create an application together. Are you ready? Okay, open a terminal, or a command prompt if you're in Windows, and type the following command. You're probably best to check the show notes for this bit. Remember, they can be found over at .NET Core.show. .NET space new space console space dash dash name space hello. So that's D-O-T-N-E-T space N-E-W space C-O-N-S-O-L-E space hyphen hyphen N-A-M-E space H-E-L-L-O. When you hit return, your computer is going to go away and scaffold an entire .NET Core console application. It will place the resulting files in a directory called hello, and the namespace will default to hello as well. Go ahead and take a look in that directory. .NET Core defaults to creating code projects in C-sharp, but that can be overridden by a CLI switch, to use F-sharp if you'd like. You should find a bunch of files in your hello directory, one of which will be called program.cs. Go ahead and open program.cs in your text editor. Uh, For the folks who are checking the show notes, I'll include a full listing of the version of the code that was generated for me. The code itself is easy to follow, especially if you have a background in C, C++, or Java. Can you guess what the code's going to do? It's one of the most famous programs in the world, and the first one that almost everyone learns to write. Let's build and run the code. Go back to your terminal and make sure that it's currently in the same directory as your program.cs file. You can use the dir command, or ls command if you're on Linux or macOS, to check. Then run the following command. D-O-T-N-E-T space B-U-I-L-D. That's .NET space build. When you hit return, the .NET Core SDK is going to take over and build our application. It'll download any new get packages that we need, put the source code through the C-sharp compiler, uh, that's also known as Rosalind, then it'll take the output and package it up into a DLL file. The DLL will be found buried in a subdirectory within the newly created bin directory. The file extension, DLL, means dynamically linked library and is a file type from Windows. But don't worry, 
as it will run on non-Windows machines. When you're ready to see the output of our program in all of its glory, type the following command. Again, assuming that you're in the same directory as your program.cs file. dot space r-u-n. That's dot net space run. What will happen here is that the dot net core runtime will take over. It'll be passed a reference to your DLL and it will run the binary code found within it. Uh, that's a bit of a lie as the DLL contains what is called IL or intermediary language code. This IL is a little like a halfway house between the c sharp code we saw earlier and the binary code required to run an executable file on your computer. When your stupendously useful application is run, the IL code is read by the .NET Core runtime, and it does some magic to convert that to code which your computer can understand. All of this happens in a fraction of a second, and before you know it, Hello World is printed to the screen. But what can I actually build with .NET Core? Building Hello World is all well and good, but what about useful applications? Well, .NET Core is an implementation of the .NET standard. Uh, We'll find out what that means in a future episode, but I also mentioned it in the previous episode, so, you know, go check that one. So it has access to all of the APIs, methods, types, and system calls that the .NET standard outlines. Because of that, you can technically write anything using .NET Core. You want to write an API for a microservice? You want the web API project type. You want to write a library of functions? You want the class lib project type. What about console applications? Well, we've already seen the console project gives us this. Websites? Well, we have a bunch of options here. MVC, Razor, Blazor, and Spa. These are all part of the same namespace, which is ASP.NET Core. You can build practically anything with these project types. In fact, if you create a class library and target the .NET standard, there it is again, rather than .NET Core, then your class library becomes entirely cross-platform. This is because the same class library can be consumed by a .NET Core codebase, a .NET Framework codebase, a Mono project, and even Xamarin or Unity. How cool is that? Here's a rundown of some of the applications I've built so far with .NET Core. I'm including ASP.NET Core here for simplicity, but remember, these are two separate things. A web API for giving out high fives, a web API using Entity Framework Core to drive a SQLite database for cataloging books, an Angular-powered single-page application front-end for the book catalog I just mentioned, an entire application stack template, a Blazor application for searching the Pokemon API, a configuration management database, a few globally installed command line tools, I will cover what that means in a later episode, and some ASP.NET Core middleware packages for making websites more secure. Again, we'll cover what this means in a later episode. As you can see, or here as the case may be, you can definitely create any type of application that you could possibly want, all with our wonderful .NET Core. The developer experience. This one is a bit of a controversial topic, but I'm going to cover it anyway. Remember, I'm not a Microsoft employee, so I can't speak for them. I'm just giving my opinion here. As I said earlier, the .NET Core CLI offers a more fully featured developer experience than by using things like VS for Windows. This is, in my opinion, because Microsoft's .NET Core team wanted to target the Linux and macOS developer communities with their tooling, so they put a huge amount of effort into designing the best possible tooling for .NET Core when using the CLI. In fact, there have been a few episodes of the .NET Core community stand-ups, check the show notes for the previous episode for a link to those, where Damien Edwards has said that the VS developer experience for .NET Core needed to be improved. My opinion of this is that the .NET developer experience on VS for Windows has always been about the .NET framework, and shoehorning .NET Core into that was always going to prove problematic. You can see just how wonderful the CLI tooling for .NET Core is by issuing the following command in a terminal. dot space dash dash help. That's .NET space dash dash help. This will show you all the commands that the .NET Core SDK tooling exposes to you, and each of those commands can take a dash dash help argument and give you instant documentation. This is pretty similar to almost any CLI application on Linux or macOS. If you've ever used the Node or Angular CLIs, you'll be familiar with what I'm talking about. It's a lot easier to scaffold new applications using the .NET Core CLI than it is with VS for Windows, for example because the .NET new command, 
The command which does the heavy lifting involved with scaffolding a new application exposes a number of templates which aren't available for VS for Windows. For those reading the show notes, I'll leave the default list of templates that .NET New has access to right here. As we'll cover in a later episode, adding to that list is really quite easy and requires the use of a single command. But then again, you need to remember that these new templates won't be exposed in VS for Windows. We'll leave it there, I think. You might not think we've covered a lot here, but we really have. We've talked about how .NET Core is cross-platform, the platforms it supports, and how you can build applications with it without having to install anything on your computer. We also talked through how to get the SDK and runtime installed on your computer. In case you hadn't noticed, the runtime is bundled within the SDK installer. Some of your options for our IDEs, and how to get the .NET Core SDK to scaffold our first application. After that, we took a look at the code talked about how you can build applications in either C-sharp or F-sharp, and even took a look at how to build and run your application. I once tweeted at Jay Miller, who is an amazing person, and a good friend of mine, about how once you take your first step to learning how to be a developer, you've already become a developer. And dear listeners, if you've never written a single application in your entire life before, but you have followed along as you've been listening, you can now think of yourself as a journeyman developer. How does that feel? Anyway, that's going to do it for this episode. Hopefully you found this interesting. If you did, then let me know by sending me a tweet at .NET Core blog or head over to the website .netcore.show and let me know what you think. Remember to check the show notes for a link to a full transcription of this episode and links to a bunch of related websites and resources. These are all available at .netcore.show. And don't forget to spread the word. Leave me a rating or review on your podcatcher of choice and to come back next time for more .NET Core goodness. I'll see you all again real soon. See you later, folks.